morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in the season of Easter. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, just a reminder about our Zoom Bible studies Monday night, Tuesday morning. Uh, we continue in the Gospel of Mark on Monday night, and uh, Pastor Laura White is leading us through the book of Nehemiah on Tuesday morning. Uh, we continue to send out links and post that on social media. Thank you, everybody, who have been sending in your contributions. Uh, it has helped us in this time uh, when we've been not meeting together. So if you would continue to do that, that would help us a great deal. We do appreciate that. Our expenses are down, obviously, because we have not been uh, here. Uh, but at the same time, there are still our expenses. So, so I just appreciate everybody's generosity. Uh, we'll be, uh, within the next week or so, sending out a letter and hard copy to everybody in the congregation. Uh, with some words that I hope are encouraging, but also uh, some, uh, some thoughts as to uh, how we will begin at some point to meet again once the state of Ohio begins to loosen up restrictions. Uh, we want to be able to have some opportunities for gathering and fellowship on a limited basis uh, and also gather in a safe way. Uh, be updating you on that uh, at some point. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for worship.
us bright must our Creator be, who dwells amidst the dazzling light of vast eternity.
us hear these words from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces were downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found these things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? The, then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is getting short. The day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. And he took a seat at the table with them. He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. Then they said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road, and when he explained the scriptures to us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, The Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. As long as gossip exists, rumors will also exist. Growing up, I was taught the maxim, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, don't say anything at all. But there are people who live by a different principle. Their principle is, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, let's hear it. As long as gossip exists, so will rumors. And while most rumors are unfounded or only partly true and mostly embellishment, some rumors turn out to be fact. Is it possible for us to imagine for a moment the unimaginable rumor that was floating around Jerusalem only a few days after Jesus' crucifixion? The surprising and unexpected rumor that he had been raised from the dead. No one was expecting Easter. Jesus had told them it was coming, but they didn't understand. No one expected Easter. There was nothing that could have prepared those first followers of Jesus for what happened on that Sunday. They were good Jews. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, 
But they believed that that would happen at the end, at the end of history, when God finally brought the kingdom in its fullness, the day of the Lord would come. But it was absolutely beyond their thinking that someone could be raised in the middle of history, before history ended. Jesus had told his disciples on several occasions that he was going to be crucified and then would rise again a few days later. But in their frame of reference, the Messiah would conquer, not, not end his life in, in humiliation upon a cross. They were so hung up in trying to figure out Jesus' pronouncements about his own death that they never even considered the affirmation of his resurrection. The first unimaginable fact that the disciples had to face was on Good Friday. With the death of Jesus, their hopes and their dreams, everything that they had longed for, everything that the people of Israel had longed for were crushed before their eyes. They had left their families, these disciples. They had invested three years of their lives in following him. The one whom they believed was the Messiah, God's anointed one. And the one thing that was certain in their minds, because they had heard it ever since they were children in the synagogue, that when Messiah comes, Messiah will conquer and he will free his people. Messiah will not end up in defeat on a cross. The rule in the first century and first century Judaism is clear. If you follow someone who you believe to be the Messiah and that Messiah dies, you've got the wrong guy. You back the wrong horse. And so with Jesus' death, the disciples had to face that cold, hard truth that from their vantage point before the resurrection, they had to face the truth that somehow they had deluded themselves into believing that this Jesus was the one. But he now was dead. And their lives were in danger too. The day between Jesus' death and resurrection, the church calls Holy Saturday. It's a time for us, after Good Friday and before Easter, to contemplate in silence the meaning of Holy Week and everything that has happened and everything that is about to happen. But for those first disciples, that first Saturday sure didn't seem holy to them. In fact, it was a living hell. They hid. They hid in fear. And they wondered if perhaps they too were going to end up on crosses if the Romans found them. And they wondered if they were able to return to their families back at home in their communities. Would they return home in shame? Everyone else thinking how duped they had been to follow this, this Jesus who was now dead. In our gospel reading, two individuals are walking on the road from Jerusalem to the nearby village of Emmaus, just a few miles away. They're followers of Jesus. And they have heard unimaginable rumors that this Jesus was alive again. And they clearly don't know what to make of it. And as they're talking about what's going on, Jesus comes up alongside them and speaks to them. And we're told that they were prevented from recognizing him. What prevents them from recognizing him? Is it God? Or perhaps they are preventing themselves from recognizing him because their minds just won't believe that resurrection is possible in that day and age, in that time before the end of time. They believe he's a stranger. They're shocked when he asks them about the news. You'd have to be a stranger. You'd have to just be in from out of town to know or to not know what has been happening. 
The Romans crucified people all the time outside the walls of Jerusalem. But this specific death of this specific Jewish man somehow captured the attention of Jerusalem. Anyone who was local would know the drama that had unfolded. And as one of the individuals, and we're told his name, Cleopas, he tells the stranger why they are in despair. They tell, him, they tell this stranger about the story of Jesus. And Cleopas says, we had hoped. Notice that, past tense. We hoped, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. The death of Jesus has dashed their hopes. Messiahs don't get crucified. And rumors of his resurrection are just that. And even if somehow he was alive, they had no idea what to make of it. I mean, the Romans are still occupying Judea. They haven't been, the, Israel, the Jews haven't been liberated. Pilate's still running the show with Caesar and King Herod, who is Caesar's puppet. I mean, what good are dead messiahs, even if some have seemed to have strange visions after his death? And once the two downcast disciples are through pouring their heart out to the stranger, the stranger now speaks, and he speaks, it seems, as the Gospels tell us all throughout Jesus' ministry and his life, as he taught, he taught as one with authority. And now this stranger seems to speak with that same authority. He really does know what has happened. But he actually knows more of what has happened than anyone else. And the stranger says, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things? Enter into his glory. And then we're told, beginning with Moses and the prophets, starting with Genesis, heading all the way down through the prophet Malachi, he interprets the things about himself in all the scriptures. Jesus' followers had misread the scriptures because they had been looking at it backward, as if someone was looking through the wrong end of a telescope. And in their misreading of scripture, they had come to believe that the Messiah was going to save them from suffering when the scripture was attesting to the truth that the Messiah was going to save them through suffering. Resurrection changes everything. Without it, suffering and death are meaningless. With it, with the resurrection, even suffering and death, are used for the purposes of God. In the story of the Emmaus Road, Luke wants us to wrestle with the so what question, the so what that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Because the answer to that question makes all the difference in, in the world. No wonder this rumor was so unimaginable. Jesus' death in the minds of the disciples had closed the door on the possibility of Jesus' Messiahship. They and no one else expected Easter. It came upon them without warning because they lived in a world where death has the last word. And you know, we live in that same world, it seems at times, doesn't it? You know, we all know the adages the old adages of adjustment to present arrangements. So we say these things that just adjust. We'll say things like, you can't fight City Hall. 
or just mind your own business, or keep your head down and adjust. It is what it is. And that's why Easter came as such a shock. Resurrection pushes us out of our present arrangements and it invites us to enter into a new world where not even death has the final say. Even the unspeakable death of crucifixion would be turned into a symbol of hope throughout the centuries. Just think of how many of us wear crosses around our necks, necklaces. The cross has become a symbol of hope. No one, no one in this day and age would wear a necklace of an electric chair, a symbol of execution, and yet we wear the symbol of Roman execution as a sign of hope, all because the tomb is empty and the cross does not have the last word. And so Luke tells us as the two on the Emmaus road get to their destination, an inn, they invite their stranger, they invite their stranger friend to stay the night with them. I mean, I think any of us would do the same. Here we are listening to the stranger for the first time. We have a new way of looking at all of this in the midst of this desperate, hopeless situation. This stranger has given us some hope. We want to hear more. I want to hear more. Stay with us. Once inside, as they prepare to eat, their newly found friend does something he had done many times before, and he did it in a particularly memorable way just a few days before in the Last Supper. Luke tells us he blessed and he broke the bread. And it's at that point we're told that the two disciples finally recognize Jesus. Jesus, who had taught the disciples to pray for daily bread, who blessed and broke the bread, now in his resurrection, in breaking the bread, has truly become the bread of life for them and for us and for the whole world. Sometimes people who, after their deaths, they leave instructions, if they're cremated, they'll leave instructions what to do with their ashes. Sometimes uh, some people want their ashes spread on maybe a lake where they used to go fishing or, or perhaps on a piece of ground that's very important to them. Sometimes human ashes are sprinkled from airplanes. Brian Kelly, according to the Associated Press, had something really spectacular in mind for his ashes. In July of 1994, Kelly, who lived in suburban Detroit, suffered from serious complications after surgery, and he was told by his doctors that there was nothing that, that could be done. As he made preparations for his death, Kelly instructed his family on what he wanted done with his remains after he was cremated, and the request was unusual, but the family granted it. Kelly's boss, whose name was Mary McCavitt, who worked at Independence Professional Fireworks in Osseo, Michigan, rolled up Kelly's ashes in a 12-inch round fireworks shell. And on Friday, August 12th, at a convention of fireworks technicians near Pittsburgh, they fired that shell with Kelly's remains into the sky, and it trailed two silvery comet tails, and as it ascended into the night sky, then it exploded into red and green stars. Kelly went out of this world with a bang and in a blaze of glory. Friends, as unique and as spectacular as that seems, there's nothing compared to the glory that God intends for our bodies in resurrection. For those of us who follow Jesus Christ, 
the risen Christ, the glory of our resurrection bodies when that time finally comes. The glory of our resurrection bodies will far surpass any fireworks. Any explosions, any trails of color that we can imagine. Instead of a cannon, there's going to be the sound of a trumpet, the trumpet of God, and Jesus calling us out of our graves into resurrected eternity. In glorious resurrected bodies like Jesus himself, we will meet the King of Kings who bright, whose brightness is brighter than light. That's what's in store for us because of Easter. The resurrection of Christ has transported us into a new world even now. And we are to live that glorious resurrection event right now in the present because it started. There's more to come, but it has started. And all of this that we celebrate in this season, some 2,000 years later, all of this started with an unimaginable rumor some 2,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, on a Passover Sunday. And it was an unimaginable rumor that turned out to be true. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, there are those who believe that your son's resurrection is just a false rumor, a wishful fairy tale believed by people who should know better. But we who worship on this day know otherwise. We know that what is impossible for us is possible for you. We believe that what is beyond our power is not beyond yours. So ever-loving God, May we take the news of your son's life of Easter to a world in need of hope, to a world in need of new life, to a world in need of resurrection. Amen.
Amen.